Uh, so my name is Tori Ritter. I'm a uh, non-game wildlife biologist with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Uh, so basically, if, it's a if you don't hunt fish or trap for it, that's kind of my wheelhouse. So your songbirds, amphibians, small mammals, things like that. Uh, also, a big part of my job is working on land acquisitions and conservation easements. Um, so tonight we're having this public hearing because we are working on a project just outside of town here uh, called the Stump Town Addition to the Garrity Mountain Wildlife Management Area. Uh, so for tonight, I'm just going to go through a few slides, show you some cool pictures of the property and talk a little bit about it. Um, and then we'll have a section where we'll just take questions from you guys. If you have any issues, anything you want to bring up, uh, things you need clarification on. And then at the end of the meeting, we'll take public comment, and that'll be your chance to actually get up and get on the record, support opposition of the project, whatever you want to say about the project. We'll take those notes, and we'll incorporate that into our overall environmental assessment process as the public comment, which we will then respond to, make any adjustments if we need to, and then release a decision notice, which will basically list out all the public comments we received and any responses we might have to those public comments. So, um, you don't necessarily have to get up and give public testimony uh, in front of everybody. We have sheets up here that you can actually fill out, write down your comments, and then mail these into us. Um, you can also comment on this proposal online, and there's details on how to do that on page uh, 21 of the environmental assessment. And we do have other copies of that up here. Uh, so, lots of ways to give public comment if you don't want to do it here. So, we'll jump right into it. Uh, I apologize if this is a little out of focus. It's about as in focus as I can get it. So, sometime addition to the Garrity Mountain WMA, uh, this has been a partnership. A uh, private landowner just outside of town here uh, put this property up for sale, approached uh, Mike Mueller with the Rock Hill Milk Foundation about potentially purchasing it, and then he came to us at Fish Life Parks, and we were obviously very interested because it's directly adjacent to an existing wildlife management area. Really amazing habitat potential that I'll show you here not the potential amazing habitat that's already there. Um, and so we're also par partnering with Natural Resource Damage Program uh, for this project. And uh, if we're successful in bringing this project forward, they would be providing a majority of the funding for this. And then we've also uh, had the Anaconda Sportsman's Club involved, and there's quite a few members here as well, um, sort of promoting this project and providing support. So this is kind of a uh, aerial view of the property from up on the ridge. So this basically this long sweeping part of the property down here and all the way down into the Warm Springs Creek bottom. And we'll go through some of that here. Uh, so there's a map, Big Stars, Anaconda. This uh, pink stuff here is the existing Garrity Mountain Wildlife Management Area. This is Mount Hagen down here. And so it's this chunk right here, right next to the DNRC land. Um, so it'd be a really good way to sort of chunk up that bit of the wildlife management area where there's this kind of this elbowy arm coming out. Um, and it also does a really good job of sort of connecting the higher elevations on the wildlife management area all the way down to the creek bottom. Uh, there's a little more detailed view of exactly where it is. So that Stumptown Road bisects uh, right in the lower, the lower elevations of the property. And here's kind of the aerial imagery view. Uh, all the stuff you can see that's kind of yellow and gold. Uh, these are all aspen stands up here. And then this big riparian area down along Warm Springs Creek, which is uh, one of the really cool features of of this piece of property. So about 554 acres, um, really good access along Stumptown Road here. Uh, this, this part of this acquisition would be managed uh, under the existing Garrity Mountain Wildlife Management Area regulations, which is a closure from, I always get this wrong. December 1st to May 15th. Closure from December 1st to May 15th, and that's to protect uh, winter elk. On the other side of the road, our plan is to have that be open year-round because that's access to the creek bottom, great area to walk around, hike around, fish, uh, and do uh, those sorts of activities. And so in terms of infrastructure development, so far uh, you'll see in the uh, EA, we don't have much planned for it. It's a wildlife management area, which means that sort of the primary goal is to manage for wildlife habitat and then recreational access and those sorts of things come up, not necessarily secondary, but just as long as they don't impede on that uh, that overall goal of managing for wildlife habitat. So we probably have parking areas along Stumptown Road, um, and then uh, these sort of two tracks that come into the WMA would be closed. So if you walk in uh, only or bike or horseback, and then um, 
in the future there might be something that goes on in terms of a parking area or rest area down in this open uh, part of the creek bottom. That's not part of this environmental assessment. Uh, we're just kind of keeping it minimal for now, just trying to get a hold of the property, incorporate it in the wildlife management area, and then have those discussions later. Before, before you change that slide, yep. there was about, what, 40 acres or 80 acres that was sold off by the owner? Yes. But I oh, thought yeah. there'd be... I thought there'd be some chunks gone out of that. It wouldn't be a rectangle. Yeah, I apologize, be... actually. This map is not entirely correct. Uh, okay. The one in your EA is correct. I forgot to put the new one on here before okay. I did this presentation. So this red line will actually go right along this road. Here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the landowner, when we when we started this project, had, uh, I think, three, sub, or three parcels subdivided here and two on this side. We decided just to simplify management and not have this, this private road going through the wildlife management area. We basically just chunked it off to so go ahead and sell those three lots there on that side of the road, and that will be our, our WMA boundary. Um, How about, was there stuff <coughs> on the north side of the stump town road for those two cabins? Or did he, is he going to remove those two cabins? He's going to remove those two okay. cabins. Yeah, okay. I'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to take you on a little tour of the property, and I'll be kneeling down here for this. But, uh, so we're first going to go through the riparian area here. Uh, this is a really, really cool area on the property. Um, this is this basically this chunk of riparian habitat along Worms Reach Creek here is one of the widest and most diverse and really kind of beautiful jungly parts of the riparian area along Worms Reach Creek. One of one of the best uh, areas. So for me, I'm into you know songbirds, woodpeckers, rafters, small mammals, amphibians, reptiles. That sort of rip riparian habitat is is huge for those those kind of species. Uh, so that's what that looks like from an aerial view. I don't have the property line on here, but it basically comes in with that. So again, that's all aspen, willow, cottonwood. Beautiful area. That's the Stumptown Road. So this is right near sort of the main entrance to the property. Warm Street Street to the right. Uh, the upper part of the domain to the left. This is the current road that goes in towards the Warm Street Street riparian area. And that is Warm Springs Creek there. So really beautiful fishing, uh, fishing stream. Uh, there's West Little Cutthroat, Bull Trout, and then you know Brown and Rainbow Trout in there as well. Um, but you can just see the amazing amount of riparian vegetation, cottonwood forest, aspen down in this river bottom. So we're really excited about this, just for public access for fishing, dog walking, swimming, picnicking, those kind of things. Um, again, this multi-story riparian vegetation all the way from the low shrubs to the mid-level mid shrubs up to those big, tall aspens. That just is a ton of habitat for birds and, and uh, you know, small mammals and things like that. Um, still a very dynamic floodplain. The creek's still moving around, which is what is maintaining that really beautiful riparian area. Uh, the really cool thing about this, one of the really cool things, is there's a lot of uh, the previous landowner had made a lot of trails that go through this area, so it's got really good access for walking around down there, but it's also really, you know, the parts that don't have a trail going through them are these kind of wild, like, jungle areas. So you've got great nesting habitat, security cover for, for uh, wildlife, while also having this great public access down there. So that's a nice, really nice combination of features. This is a meadow uh, sort of on the downstream end of the property. Uh, backwater sloughs, great places for amphibians and reptiles. And this is that big meadow area. Right now there's two little hunting cabins down there. Uh, if we're successful at purchasing this property, the, pro the current landowner will remove those two um, cabins. Moving on to the upland part. Uh, so this is kind of going to follow this uh, two-track road going up in there, which is really, really nice for walking or biking <coughs> Uh, this is just right off of Stumptown Road, looking down into the riparian area. There are corrals down in the lower area, or the, the river bottom area, and in the uplands. Uh, we'll be leaving those in place. Horseback riders can use those. Um, there's also this big historic barn that was moved there by the landowner. Uh, we're going to leave that in place. Um, we probably won't maintain it, it'll just kind of be incorporated into the wildlife habitat. You'd be amazed how many species we'll be using for those buildings. Uh, this is what the uplands look like. It's a mix of aspen and uh, mostly lodgepole pine. Up in the higher elevations, there's some limber pine and some, some big older trees. And also in the uplands are these big uh, grassland meadows. So the property, this ridge is included in the property in this whole basin here. This is a big aspen stand. 
Um, so a nice big meadow area, close to security cover, really good for uh, big game animals. Um, the Anaconda Sportsman Club members have told us that a lot of uh, elk calve in this area. Um, it's good security because there's this big open meadow, but you can't see it from the road, so the, the, the game animals can still use it without people being able to see them. <laughs> Moving on to this corner of the property, this is a really important uh, area because uh, this is the, the best winter range on the property for elk. So this is the existing wildlife management area gold there, uh, so you can see that in the, within the existing wildlife management area, there's a big chunk of winter range. The one remaining spot was this, this corner of this property. So we're really able to block that up with this purchase. Um, and that just kind of outlines that big grassland bench. And that's what that looks like looking down towards Anaconda. So when we've been out visiting this property, there's usually elk out using this, this portion of the range. So the timeline, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation uh, held us out with a purchase option so that we can kind of hold the property as we go through our public processes. Um, so we're in this, uh, this sort of joint NRDP, FWP public process right now. This public meeting is part of that. Um, basically, we are going to go to our Fish and Wildlife Commission in February to get final endorsement for this project, which is basically them, there are Fish and Wildlife Commission saying, go ahead and purchase the property when you get the funds added to the WMA, go for it. So we got initial approval, which is called endorsement, which is basically the Fish and Wildlife Commission saying, go ahead and pursue the project. We'll get that final in February, and then we'll go to the state land board, hopefully in May, I think. Yes? Uh, acronyms, I don't do too well. NRDP, some oh, kind sorry. of depredation or? Natural Resource Damage Program. Damage. Yeah, so that's the uh, State Department of Justice. Oh, and I should, have, I should have said who we have here today. So I'm uh, Tori Ritter, non-game wildlife biologist. Greg Mullen is here from Natural Resource Damage Program. Uh, we also have Martin Belukas with uh, our lands program at Fish, Life, and Parks out of Helena. And then Julie Gala is the uh, area biologist for uh, Upper Deer Lodge and Creek Valley. Tori, are you going to speak more about NRDP and its role here or not? Or is this an appropriate time? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So our tentative closing date is spring, summer 2020. So we got uh, some funding from our Habitat Montana program. We got some additional funding from uh, Montana Fish and Wildlife Conservation Trust. And uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation also made quite a bit of a contribution. But the main funding source for this project is Natural Resource Damage Program. Uh, so they have not gone through their public process yet. Well, their, their public process is rolled into our public process for this environmental assessment. So they'll use the public comment that we gather during this environmental assessment to also take it through their process for distributing the funding. Let me know if I miss any of this stuff. But. Yeah, I, I can elaborate. Sure, if you want. Yeah, sure. So, um, for those who don't know, Natural Resource Damage Program, we started back in 1990 or so. And we basically are the folks who sued Atlantic Ridgefield, um, ARCO BP, for what we call natural resource damages. So, natural resource damages are the uh, <coughs> Injuries to the basin, basically from Butte to Anaconda, I mean Butte to Missoula. So we looked at that area, and there's three major injuries that, that were there due to the hazardous substances, in this case, uh, copper and zinc for mining, are to the aquatic life, to the terrestrial life, and to groundwater. So with those three claims, we went to, we actually went to trial in Great Falls back in the mid-90s, late-90s. Uh, we settled our first uh, settlement in 1998, and our second settlement in 2008. Those are the two major settlements. Um, natural resource damage law, it's, it's part of Superfund, it's part of the, the law that um, EPA uses to do cleanup, as you all know, from Butte to Anaconda, uh, and, and, and all the way down to Missoula. <clears throat> and so the um, architects of that law thought that Superfund, the way it exists, cleans up the environment, but it doesn't go farther than usually human health and the immediate environment. So the crafters of this law looked at, at um, the need for the public to be made whole through um, looking at what, down to a baseline, what we call a baseline condition, how the natural resources could be made whole. And so the monies that we get from a, a, a lot of the lawsuits, we can use not only to restore the injured natural resources, and a good example is Silbo Creek. 
from Butte to Anaconda, you guys, if you know about Civil Creek, we worked with DEQ and we, we um, used restoration funds, about $20 million, $30 million, to go above and beyond what Remedy was going to do there and what Remedy did do there along Civil Creek. But we can also use those money, and this is what's really um, cool about this law, is that we can replace the lost services um, that were injured. So in this case, um, the injury was to wildlife habitat. We didn't necessarily have you know, dead wildlife you know, from, from, from the mining. It's, it's not like the um, Exxon Valdez or the, or the um, uh, big case in Louisiana, the Deepwater Horizon, where there's dead mammals and, uh, and all that from direct, direct uh, result from the hazardous substances. But we had wildlife uh, habitat that was lost. So what the law allows us to do is use these monies to replace that lost habitat. And in this case, we can actually purchase um, land for, for wildlife habitat. So that's what we've done over the decades with Welcome, we're here. I'm great, how are you? Good. Okay. I'll give you the bill. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, um, Thank you. anyways, in a broader um, aspect, the, the uh, game range here, the, um, that surrounds the, the property we're talking about today, we bought that back in um, use for, uh, NRD funding back in 2000, 2001, for the whole Garrity Mountain um, WMA. So, Anyways, if any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, but that's kind of what it, but, uh, sure. Oh, I thought, I thought oh, okay. that was Oh, sure. Just real quick question, you referenced a law. What law are you talking about? <clears throat> CERCLA. You the, cir the Superfund, it's called Superfund, but the CERCLA law, uh, okay. that was enacted back in 1980. A federal law. Federal law. Thank you. I was wondering if you're talking about a state or a federal law. Yes, Thank you. federal law. That was my question, if it was federal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Real quick, too. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand how much money is out there for this sort of thing. Is this something that has been already earmarked for potential projects like this, or no. could be used for other stuff, too? No, that's or? a good question. Um, <clears throat> the lawsuit itself, it's a, it, we had kind of, it was about a third is earmarked for groundwater, about a third earmarked for you know, wildlife enhancement, and about um, a, th a third for the aquatic aquatic injury, you know, replacement and or direct restoration for each. Um, to date, we've pretty much expended all the groundwater uh, monies, <clears throat> and that was to the tune of about $120 million for both Butte and Anaconda, uh, a replacement of um, their, you know, uh, basically their water supplies is what we did a lot of that of, um, water treatment plants, uh, water lines, etc. Um, um, both here in Anaconda, we replaced uh, probably eighty percent of the of the water lines, and then as far as aquatics, with that's probably the least that we spend thus far. But we, again, we, it's probably in the eighty million dollar range we have for that. And then the terrestrial, we're down to I don't know, maybe you know, fifteen million left or something. But we've <coughs> spent monies on quite a few acquisitions, such as spotted dog. So is this, in your mind, kind of a slam dunk deal then? It is. This is a this is a really good project. It fits in with our goals. We we have a restoration plan out there with with goals, and one of them being um, habitat. You know, looking at a large picture. So this this project, even though it's only 600 acres, it, it kind of fits in with the whole uh, large area, and so that you know wildlife travel in big areas. So that's that's a real good um, part of our goal versus buying a small you know 100 acre section somewhere that's not surrounded by private lands or something doesn't. You don't necessarily have the um, the benefits that this project would have. Thank you. Somewhere in the smorgasbord of all of this, with all the different entities, I read through the plan, and it had something to do with uh, <coughs> federal kind of funds, and you would be waiting uh, almost like uh, a crapshoot to see if you could get those. Uh, am I talking about something else? You know? I think it, yeah, so. I think you might be talking about Miller Lake. And so if those two projects are being confused because both of them are in the news right now. So in Miller Lake, they've applied for a large pot of federal money. They've applied for <coughs> to have some of it allocated to Miller Lake. In this case, this it's a, who makes the decision? Does the advisory council and then the governor eventually make well, the decision? Well, the governor is the trustee. So, okay. so in this case, it's the governor is the trustee for natural resource damage funds. Yeah, so it's state, it's state monies, but it's from a lawsuit. Yep. And the other, the other thing is, is that this is a purchase that would bring title to FWP, um, and they would have the ownership. So that's that's what we would work through. 
there are folks of the Miller Lake project is going to be mostly, if not all, forest service ground. So it's we're going after a different pot of money. Management strategy would be different, you know. So it's so there. So when we comment on this thing, we're bending Tory and Martin's ears and Julie's ears, and there, there hopefully there should be some other ears we should bend to. And so they're the state people that we're. That they're going to decide what we're going for. And the, the way it's been described to me by I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's good. The way it's been described to me by Greg is: Look, this money was won in the lawsuit as a way to make the people of Anaconda and the Upper Clark Fork Basin whole for damage. Correct. And what this property, the reason this property fits, is because <clears throat> it enhances, it would enhance the lives and the resource values of the people of Anaconda and the Upper Clark Fork Valley. <clears throat> and then right. there's a process in which we apply to the program, Greg administers, and. We we hope that they agree to give us the money. Yeah, I, 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 thank you, Martin, for that. And a huge guiding principle of the monies that we received is that the monies we spend in the Upper Clark Fork River Basin. So again, where the where the injury occurred, from, you know, future as well. One more follow up question, okay. just for clarification. You speak about the money that you have on this resource <coughs> damage or whatever acronym you want to use on that comes from a lawsuit. Who was that lawsuit against, and was it initiated by the state of Montana, or was it a private lawsuit <clears throat> under the circle of law? Or can it, you just give a brief, quick summary of where that come from? Sure. <clears throat> um, as trustees to natural resources, the state's allowed to sue for natural resource damages. You're so talking in this about case, the state was, land board. So it was, it was the state of Montana. Um, it was. The, you know, the governor has an authority, he's the trustee for natural resource damages. So this was a lawsuit to the private company, Atlantic Ridgefield. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tori. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's about all I had for this. Uh, that's my contact information at the bottom. Um, so if you want, if you have any questions or if you want to talk more, if you want to give public comment outside of all the other avenues, uh, feel free to call me, email me. I'd be happy to talk to you about the project. Corey, I, I'd give some perspective, I guess. Sure. Um, from my perspective, it's kind of in the club, and you know, I'll let our officers testify from the club. But I, you want to let you know, introduce yourself? Make yeah. Sure know I, we are. <laughs> no, let me get up there because I'm going to talk for. Are we going to start some public comment? Is this a Good segue into the public comment period. If you guys um, are ready. As long as everybody's questions, does anybody have any other questions that we want to get answered first? Lots of questions, but not sure where to go. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> and you'll have lots of opportunity, but if you're, Chris, if you're going to go ahead and speak, we might as well make it formal. You got a recorder? <laughs> yeah. Um, and who are you? I'm Chris Marchand. So, um, Go back to the, because I, I, you got to have a little history in this in order to understand where we're at. But this ground was ground that was Anaconda Company ground that was purchased years ago to protect the watershed, the airshed, all that stuff. And, you know, we purchased over the years, we originally purchased the Mount Hagen Game Range, and, and um, then we got Stucky Ridge, and then we bought the watershed property. And I was the guy that instituted the watershed project I started had the concept of it, sold it on RY, and then got the old foundation involved in and whatever. So I have a lot of background. When we did, the reason I say that is when we did the watershed project, this particular piece of ground fell out. It was RY's ground, and you, most of you would say, some of you would say, well, why was it in the, when we purchased the watershed, why didn't you do that? And the reason is, is that we chiseled off anything that RY owned that had public access because it drove up the purchase price of the property. And it was a 20, it ended up a $22 million project. And real honestly, I thought I was smoking dope when I proposed the thing $22 million, 35,000 acres 25 years ago, you know, that, hey, let's go do this. Chris, just for clarity, because everybody here probably knows that. When you talk about the watershed project, what you're talking about is Garrity Mountain. Is a Garrity Mountain, which was 35,000 acres. So we bought 35,000 acres for $22 million that was originally Forest Service ground. It went to the Anaconda Company that was owned by ARCO that was given to Dennis Washington that RY got so they could log it all. That's the history of the, of the thing. There's, Did you mean YT? Or, or YT, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, yeah, well, 
So it's YT Timberlands and RY Sawmill, they're the same. Okay. Yonke was the owner, he has, if it was his timber holdings, it was YT Timberlands, and if it was a sawmill, it's RY gotcha. the Sawmill. Yes. So it's, but, they're, but they're the same entity, they're same not the guy. same entity, but same guy, you know. And Ron Yonke was really a, really a great guy to work, really a class guy. And um, so what we did, we chiseled off properties like this property because it had, as you can tell, a Stumptown Road went through there. And so it would have, the more access you had, the more drives drove up the value. And we didn't, as sportsmen, we were interested in getting the property. And as long as we had a road up to Garrity Mountain, we had a road up Twin Lakes and stuff, we were like, we'll take it, you know, let's, you got to bite off what you can bite off. And it was, this was a big enchilada to begin with without making it bigger, Greg. Greg wasn't even around when I started this thing to, to be as, it goes that far back. So, this piece of ground was sold <laughs> off and a guy that was fairly wealthy had some designs on it and did the things that are up there, the gate work and all of that stuff that was up there. And then he never did anything. He had it, you know, as the, what you hear is that his concept was a real high-end development. Never happened. And then he sold it to the owner that, that we have now and he put those two little cabins in there and his kids came up and stayed once in a while and recreate up here, I think mostly hunted, but I, I don't know. The guy that owns the property now, this is kind of interesting, at one time was the CEO of the Rocky Mountain Health Foundation. And so he has a conservation ethic and understands land things and, and all of that. So when he his interest in this property waned, he called the Elk Foundation and said, I'm thinking about selling this, would you? And so that's how this project got started. And um, so now, to comment on the property as I look at it, that's why we didn't do it before, but we obviously, the public has great interest in this property. It has wildlife values, especially the stuff that's on the south side of the road. Um, but it has a lot of other values, and the, and the property that is down, has a creek frontage on it, that is a tremendous, as you mentioned, Corey, is that that's, a, Tory, that's a, a, a good fishery down there, and so we're very interested in opening that up to the public, and so we'd be interested in looking that as a, to me, I would propose what needs to be on the agenda at some point, is developing a fishing access site with a road that goes down there in an appropriate place, and outhouses and places for people to park, and, and I don't think it's out of the question. I think it, we should have as an opening that someday, someday, I don't, I'm not proposing we do this, but that at some point maybe we want to put a campground in there. And I'm not, at this point I'm not proposing it, but, but I don't want us to buy this thing and then 15 years from now or 10 years from now, we come in and go, God, we could really use a campground in here. Lost Creek's always filled up, you know, whatever. And we, and we say all these people want to stay by the creek and that would be an amenity anaconda. We come to the FWP and say, we'd like to put a campground. Well, no, you can't do that. It's a wildlife management area. We bought this as a fishery thing. We're not going to do a campground. We're buying it with NRD money. That was for all of the, so folks understand, and this club played a huge role in winning that NRD money. So when I speak of it, I speak as kind of an owner in that money because the money wouldn't be, if it wasn't for this club, Montana Wildlife Federation, <coughs> a whole bunch of other people, you, we would never have had that pot of money. And, uh, and it was a tough fight. But we had to document the recreational resources that we lost because of the damage from the smelter and mining and all of that. So the idea behind this also is to replace those, those values. And so, that, and so to replace and have a fishing access site down there and that I think needs to be on the agenda. The other thing that I look at is that to make this wildlife management area usable by the public, I don't want to see us buy a bunch more land where the access by the public is down on the Stumptown Road. Okay. We deserve to get off the Stumptown Road, okay? We have private landers that are going to live behind us. We need to have as good access as they have. We need to get at least to the, to the mountain. So I would suggest that what you see, I would rather see one of those old roads be used to put an access site that gets us a quarter of a mile or a half a mile back off of the road. I don't want to get up on the ridge, but to get people back in there off the road um, so we don't have to park on the road. Um, the other thing that has been suggested is there is an archery club in Anaconda that would like to build a silhouette range and they want something close to town and this fits their bill. 
I don't know if the range down onto the north side of the road is the most appropriate place. It seems like on the south side of the road. Um, and I don't know that they need access outside of the dates that we would traditionally want it closed. But again, to, be, to put an access in there, get off the road several hundred yards where they could put a range in that one of those bottoms. And it, it seems so. There are other uses for this property that I think fit with what that NRD money was and um, make it more usable and are not antagonistic to the values of wildlife or fisheries. So that is, I don't know if I covered everything, but that's a lot. It's, that's, that's, that's my pitch. Um, um, that we, that, and, and maybe we need to have some more serious discussions before we go forward about which plot of monies have to be available. I mean, I wish that from Region 2, I mean, it's great you're here for wildlife, but we don't have anybody here from fisheries necessarily. And I think that there's really, and I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know why that is, but it, well, I know part of it is we didn't have a biologist, so, so that's yeah, part of it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I understand we have one. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, but I think there's fishery issues, and I think there's public recreational issues involved in this whole thing. It's not, it's not like when we brought the Brickley property and we went, oh man, this is, this is a key part of our wildlife management area. Da, da, da. We don't want a road up there. We want, I would like to see us have a little better access than the access we have. But that's down the road, and we got to resolve that Piper Gulch thing, you know, and that's not going to get resolved in the near future. But it would be nice to have better access in there. And I would say that historically the public did have some better motorized access into, through this property than what you're proposing. So I, I would suggest that we need to look at something, again, that would be seasonal. Um, maybe we don't open it until June 15th until those elk are done cabin in there. Um, but something that in the fall is open for people that want to archery hunt or rifle hunt to get them off the road, get them a little closer to, um, again, I mean, long term, we, in the summer and the fall, we don't want that wildlife. We want it the farther away from town, the better. And if we have a little different access and we push those animals farther up into their natural range in the summer and early fall, I think that's appropriate. So, so those are... Those are my thoughts. <laughs> so if you want to get public testimony, you can just stay seated, stand up, get in the front of the room, like Chris did, whatever. Just state your name, and if you're representing an organization, let us know. Um, and then if everyone's okay with it, I'm just going to record this on my phone. Uh, if anybody would rather I not do that, I can sit here and write down those comments, but they'll be a little bit paraphrased because it's hard to keep up with everybody. So. Is everybody okay with uh, just a phone recording of the meeting? Okay. All right. Anyone else want to give testimony? Is that the question? Sure. What are the deadlines for comments? Uh, so the deadline for comments is, let me make sure I get this right. December 11th. December 11th. Thank you. Good job. December. Correct. You know, and I'm going to build on that in one way. So part of the reason that Greg is here and the NRDP, that NRDP allocation of monies, meaning the, the monies from that lawsuit that, that Greg helps administer, are they have a public process as well. And so one of the things we're trying to do is streamline this whole thing by doing it at the same time. Okay. Um, and so uh, that money has not been for sure allocated to this project or anything else, but when it comes time, a lot of that due diligence is going to have occurred. And so... Uh, that's why Greg is so. That's why we're, the NRDP program is involved in this particular. Meeting. May I ask a couple quick questions? Sure. I don't have any particular comment. Um, I know there's a lot of fencing around that property, and I know that may or may not be. I'm not an expert in fencing, but I don't know if that's a, a an issue for habitat, for wildlife, or not, and whether or not that needs to come out, or if it's going to stay in or what the thought or process is on that, and kind of referring to what Chris was saying earlier about access for sportsmen and whatnot. You've got those series of corrals in there, which seems like a logical place for, I know people access um, other parts of that property, nearby Garrity property via horseback, 
maybe that'd be a perfect place for a parking area, that sort of thing. And if you were going to do that, you know, would you close the gate during the December to May period, or how? I don't know how that would work, but like, what's the proposed thought process there, and how does that input change over time, or how do we have influence there as a public, or as the public? So this environmental assessment, this process is basically just to acquire the property, and then we also have some very basic stuff <coughs> for creating some parking areas along Stone Town Road. Uh, this sort of stuff moving forward with potential developments, additional parking areas, other access, is stuff that we can visit later. We probably have to go through another EA process to do that sort of development work. Okay. So we're working on sort of the baseline level right now. And all these ideas are, I mean, you know, this is because, you know, assuming we get Fish and Wildlife Commission approval for this, doesn't necessarily preclude any of this other, these other ideas from happening. That's just conversations that will happen down the road, and then we can potentially propose another. So, for, for example, you are talking about this archery club, which I know I know of uh, to some degree, just some of the people who are involved in it. Um, sounds like an interesting idea, but probably better for the south side of the road versus the north side, because that's kind of like what we're talking about for fishing access. So if they wanted to do something, what would be the recommendation on processes for them to, like, hey, can we, can we start that conversation about an archery range or public parking. How do we? How does that process actually work? Um, I've talked to those guys a little bit, um, and we kind of brainstormed some hurdles that we'll have to come over. And the big one Chris mentioned already is that they probably use it when the WMA is already open, which mm -hmm. is great. It's basically that side of the road will be hands off as far as anything after December first for another range. Um, and kind of just to Tori's point. Um, once we get the property, that's when we'll start doing, even amidst ourselves, you know, talking to Brady Shortman, our WMA supervisor, on what we're going to do with some of these buildings and plans for that. Um, and that'll all incorporate their own EAs as far as, you know, what impact that's going to have to improve or sacrifice and cost and stuff like that. So um, just kind of for that general conversation, that will be something to develop further on. and. Um, that it's something new for me, so I've been asking other folks. I know um, people in Butte were referencing, there's another kind of similar archery range on Forest Service or Private Land by Forest Service or something. Um, and for them to get more information on some models <coughs> other sportsman clubs have put in. And we'll just try and, uh, I think as we keep going, uh, keep our wording and our goals fairly, you know, not vague or, you know, nondescript but leave room for projects like this if we want to do a campground or an archery range or you know if we want to put a parking area further back or install horse pit, uh, hitching posts um, little things like that will come further down but um, I mean can certainly I don't know if that could be part of your comment now is that you'd just like to see that in our description and purchasing and managing it but. yeah I, I think the short answer for your question to your question is though some group will come forward with a proposal they would likely go to Julie because she's local. Mm -hmm. She would bring it to, she might say right off the bat, like, this is inconsistent with the wildlife values right off the bat. I could tell you, like, we're not going to have a year-round underground shooting range or something like that. <laughs> but she might say, hey, this would work. Season. Probably visit, visit and figure out the legal mechanism. So we have various leases. We have, FWP has leases. We have cooperative agreements. We have no-cost agreements. We have cost shares. We have all those sorts of things. Any one of those, and there, there would likely be some public involvement in the development of whether or not that process was appropriate. And then there's formalized, when we're talking about EAs, that's uh, the Montana Environmental Policy Act. Everything that we do that has any kind of significance on the ground impact has a formalized public process just like this. So, but I think as a, um, I think initially what will happen is there will be a plan for managing this wildlife management area. And that, will that go to an EA? That's, or will that get that's actually in the back of the comment. Okay, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. so there's a basic management plan for this addition as an appendix to the EA, which kind of outlines the basic improvements we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. has some stuff in there about the fencing. Um, so yeah, so a, a, that would be another process later would be that development. So, for example, we're working on a fishing access site elsewhere in Region 2. That one is an EA that's the acquisition and development in one EA <coughs> because it's a fishing access site, and necessarily, whenever we incorporate a fishing access site, we do some development as well. So we wrap that all up into one EA. 
this is more of a purchase the land, incorporate it as part of the WMA, and there's certainly potential for next steps down the road as we come along with those conversations. Uh, it says in here that uh, the fence will remain, but will come to wildlife standards. Will we? Yep, so that's the fence along Stumptown Road, and I think we also said for the one along Rabbit and Dahl Road. Did I say that right? The boundaries. No. Yeah, boundaries. Um, so that was mostly just to keep people from, you know, driving off the road and, and heading out to those big fields or something. That wouldn't happen here. <laughs> and so now that you went full circle on fence, uh, Joe had that initial question about that when you talk about archery, but I read through this and I noticed that it's talking about barbed wire, existing barbed wire fence along Stumptown Road. That is not correct. There's a five, it said a three strand barbed wire. It's Currently, a five-strand, what you guys are uh, terming it, defining it as a tensile type. It is an electric type fence. So, just going to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Tori? Yes. Um, my name is Debbie Jurisich. I live in the West Valley Tracks, which is right adjacent to this property. Go ahead, can you spell your last name? J U R C I C H. C I C H, okay, thank you. And that fencing runs along the alley along the West Valley tracks of the exact same kind of fence as what's on Stumptown. Okay. And it is, has been electrified in the past. Um, and the animals have gotten caught up in it quite often. Okay. And have had to have um, fish wildlife come up and mm -hmm. take care of them. So you're talking about the, so. uh, on the north side of Wake Street? Okay. Yeah. And so that fence would be made for wildlife well, we, we want to maintain fences in areas where it prevents off-road travel, right. prevents people from, we don't necessarily need fences elsewhere that where they would cause a problem for wildlife movement. Right. I'm not sure what we would want to do a lot because that's along a, near that road there. I think yeah. um, it's right along that whole alley. Yeah. Is there, is there an alley in back of that property? Yeah. Of all there, those properties? Yeah, it's a Why final lane that goes all the way behind the houses mm -hmm. for the like, full two blocks. I think we could say right off the bat, like, there's... <clears throat> There's no contemplation of electrifying any of that. No, definitely not. No. Okay. Um, and would there be access? I mean, it kind of goes back to what Joe was saying and, and Chris with that area prior to the private owner. YT Timber was a private owner, but it wasn't held as private land. Right. And kids were able to go back there and play and build forts and, you know, in all those trees and go back and hit the frick and fish and that kind of stuff. Would there be access from our side also, other than the stump side, stump side? So what we were talking, so no matter what, anywhere, when the WMA is open, you can walk through the fence. Yeah, kids can crawl through the fence. There's no, um, there's been some discussion about whether there is public access on that north side. I don't think that there is, from my research, kind of by the storage units. I don't think there's public access. And so one thing Chris had talked about was, boy, is there a way, this is years down the you know, are we going to have to put a pedestrian footbridge over it or something? But just to be clear, when we're talking about restricting access, there would be legally, <coughs> on the upper part, on the south side, there would be legally restricted access, mm -hmm. meaning like you can't go on it at all from December 1st to May 15th. Okay. But in terms of people walking out their back door and going on and utilizing this land, like, enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Although on this portion we're talking about not, not even having, having those winter So that would be year round. So right. be, be right. If you want a post hole around back there in a yeah. swamp. Like, yeah. And uh, as far as fencing style goes, um, for instance with our spotted dog WMA, um, our boundary fences we've actually enacted more wildlife friendly fencing. So that means smooth barbed wire, smooth wire, so not barbed, and then different distances between each time just so um, like the, they get sheep things. Um, not quite sheep fence because we don't need the yeah. paneling on the bottom, but something that either fawns or whatnot can go under, or things that jump over the fence are less likely, likely to get their foot stuck. So we could see improvements like that eventually as our management or our WMA management crew um, has the money and time to do so. But um, that's and probably that's like, I don't know extent. what the proper term is, but it's the sheep fence that runs that alley. You know, the yeah. wire squares. If that's the oh, boundary, it's... then yeah, yeah, we will replace that. If it's something internal, then we might actually just take out the yeah, thing. No, but it sounds boundary. like it's yeah, at the edge of that alley there. So you'd expect to see that within a few years anyway. Okay. Do you see moose back there? Yes. I would think you would. Yep. Okay. See moose, bear, deer, elk, 
There's a mountain lion back there like a week or two ago. <laughs> I haven't seen the cat. I've heard of him, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I also hear some howling back there. <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say that unless we're fencing out cattle, we don't necessarily want fences because of the, the issues you yeah. brought up, wildlife entanglement. Yeah. Movement. Limited issues. fences that are mostly for people movement prevention. I really just trying to prevent parking on that land. Mm, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Four-wheel vehicles and that. So, in the meantime, then, I know we have some access to the Garrity Mountain, uh, where the new placard is, uh, mm -hmm. just slightly west of that property, which is beautiful. Um, is that going to be a primary access point until we kind of get everything ironed out? Or, in terms of, you know, accessing the south side of the property where the, the corral is, or the north side where the fishing will be? Yeah. I'm just thinking, think like, if people know yet. this is a new place that they can spend their time publicly, like, where are they going to park? Right along Stumptown? Or what's the access going to be like? So the general idea is to create park, fairly small parking areas. I think, like, I think in the EA it's four to eight vehicles or something like that, directly off of Stumptown Road. Kind of, you know, where, do you know where the big entrance gate is now? And On the, the north road. side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's okay. the road. Okay, where the cabins are now? Bottom. Yeah. Okay. So somewhere around there is the general idea, to just have a parking area initially to get people access directly down there so they don't have to park way down the road and then walk to it. That makes sense. And then of course we're going to look in future, in the future, what is the best way, how much use are we getting, where do we want to direct people to park, and that's where we may go into possibly having people go through the gate into the, the, the fields near the right period area. But that's been asking a lot of questions. Um, no, keep going. There are a lot of horse people too. My, my father and mother-in-law well, I'm sure would love to ride their horses up there. If they're going to do that, you know, where would they park necessarily? Would it be on the north side of the road in that same area, or is it going to be more pedestrian type access? Um, can they take horses straight through? I don't, I don't know if there's gates that would be locked. I don't know. What's the... I think that's, yeah, just kind of future specifics that we'll iron out. But absolutely, I think typically when we design any kind of parking area, we try and make it at least so you can turn the trailer around. Right. Um, I don't know, I mean, with the Garrity, with the viewing area, I don't think it's necessarily intended to park a bunch of trailers there, but you can. Right. Um, but, yeah, certainly with that in mind, and kind of as if we are doing a public comment or an EA on access or developing a parking lot, that's something that will seek out comment for how people would like to use it, too. So, I think we can see, yeah, uh, just, um, what's the word? Those things can be developed, I think, after we purchase it, which is the main thing right now. But I, I think you could take solace in, with, in the idea that like most wildlife management areas, they provide some access, they provide a place to park, they provide a place, they, they welcome non-motorized access, um, and, and I, I think it's a, a logical assumption that we would develop low-cost facilities and do the same thing. Yeah. Cool. Kind of whatever we, you can currently do on that south part of Garrity, you can expect that to be maintained with this new property, <coughs> except for the north side, which will probably be open year round. We learn a lot from having these properties of public ownership and just seeing how it goes for a little while. The level of public use, where people want access, what type of access, where. And that way we don't build a bunch of stuff ahead of time trying to predict exactly how it's going to be used. We can be a little more on the responsive side. Not necessarily waiting around until there's damage issues, but being able to see how it goes for a while and then develop that. Yeah. Did you have a question? I wear a couple hats tonight just for everybody's information. I'm recording this for Redoubt News because of a couple of reasons. One, number one, is public transparency on actions such as this that involve a lot of money that come from taxpayers needs to be out there on the table and make sure that they know what's going on, where it's at, the time frame where they can get involved. And so that's, that's part of why I'm here with Redoubt News Montana. Now I'm going to change hats. My name is Tim Ravendahl, and you're talking about my backyard growing up. And I'm going on record right now adamantly opposing what you're doing. And I'll tell you a couple reasons real quick, and then I'll let it go from there. Number one, I just had our family had contact with Ray that owns this property that you guys are looking at purchasing now. As of yesterday, he had no idea this hearing was going on. He was not notified. He was not contacted. He did not know. Now, if he was made contact through Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or the Anaconda Sportsman's Club or any other private 
organization, that's one thing. But to have a state agency promoting a hearing and not having that information out, it's problem with transparency again, uh, where the two halves they kind of interchange. I am a houndsman. I'm a lion hunter. I've hunted this area since 1972 when Ray Went took me on my first lion hunt. We went a long ways in managing mountain lion management and I personally was involved in the early 90s when we developed the mountain lion EIS to manage biologically rather than socially. Okay, It went a long ways kind of got back into the social realm since then, but we are losing a lot of opportunity to maintain a balance between habitat and prey base because of things like this that happen where we're losing access more and more every day. You make a de facto wilderness where it's only foot or horseback, and in this case, a wildlife management area that's completely closed down from December 1st till May 15th. Guess when mountain lion season opens up? I once told Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission that if you think I'm causing stress running into an area to hunt mountain lions, how much stress on that elk do you think is being caused by that mountain lion that's eating every other one that he gets to? It's very factual. It's, it's habitat versus prey. And, and we have a lot of habitat here that's been locked out. Um, I, I thank you, Chris, for correcting that it was not our Y, but it's YT-owned property that sold this out. I run my logging business for several years, making money off of it. Your plan here does not talk about future management other than wildlife. If you look at the Elkhorn Wildlife Management Unit out of Helena, wow, talk about a de facto wilderness that's maintained for wildlife and all the resources are going to waste. If you go back up behind Garrity right now and you look at the regen that's coming in, you got another harvest of timber, but was it locked into perpetuity into a wildlife management area and specifically for the purpose of wildlife management, you're losing that resource. I gotta go back to what we were saying about resource damage. What in that? I'm I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit personal here. <coughs> what the hell does Atlantic Richfield damage done to what you're talking about right here. There isn't any. Everything Mother Nature has cured and fixed in so many ways. If you could show me something on that land that I've walked around on for the last 45, 50 years that's damaged by the smelter, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd have to say, okay, I, yeah, I'm wrong. But you're talking about land that's been healed since environmentalism closed the smelter, and, and we have lost a lot of we lost the recreation because we lost access to the land now, and it's getting worse. Now, finally, and I'll just get off my soapbox and let you guys go about and beat me up if you like, because I'm open for it. What in the hell is going on with Anaconda Deer Lodge County losing all of the tax base by turning this over to a state agency that does not pay taxes on this land? Where is the benefit going to come from from that? I'm so going to tell you right I, now, I there that. is no taxes paid on state land. So you're incorrect. Uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does pay taxes. What you're talking about is state trust land, which is land that's held in trust for the common schools and the higher education institutions of Montana. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does pay taxes on land. We will pay the exact same taxes that Ray pays there now. In fact, his buildings, we will probably pay more because presently his buildings are not on the tax rolls. Well, you confuse real property with private property as far as, as real estate versus the real you estate can't. we pay we the pay buildings real are not 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 what I'm talking about. Okay, well they are on your real property tax statement so Since I YT that's sold that ground, the tax base to Deer Lodge County has gone. That may be, but I'm just saying and now we're we are going another to another five hundred and sixty acres? No, you're incorrect. We are paying taxes on that land. If Fish Wildlife Parks does pay taxes on that land and will pay taxes on that land. I'd like to see the figures on that because I don't, I don't think I've ever seen where Fifth Wall Do you want me to tell you how much they will pay? I, I have it. Fifth Wall Parks is out of control on funding anyway, so there. We don't get along on that either. Here, go up, go up to the courthouse, look at what FWP owns in this county, and look at the taxes that we pay. Our sportsman's dollars pays those taxes. All the money we bought in the watershed, that on Garrity Mountain all the way down here, 
over to Mill Creek. They pay taxes on it every year. We so it's under just, just like when it was under Anaconda ownership, just like when it was under YT's ownership, we pay taxes. And us, when you buy a hunting license, that's part of what you do. You help pay for those taxes. So that is Montana Code Annotated 871603. And that says that we pay the county a sum equal to the amount of taxes payable on the county assessment if the property were in private ownership. That's 871603. And right now the taxes on that parcel are $616 a year. I, I mean, no, I mean, that's, can't that's, correct it if that's the case, but I've sure. seen too much of land being locked up out of private where taxes are paid and government does not pay taxes. Show me a county that pays taxes on anything. They don't even pay taxes on fuel. That's the reality that we live in. All right. But I am on record going against it, and I will make a written comment on it. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Rich Day, and I'm on the board of Stewart Grant Trout Unlimited. <coughs> and uh, we were involved in the last little purchase, I think it was about 126 acres, I believe. Little That little piece that we just put on to Garrity. Up on the Lime Kiln Road. On the Lime Kiln Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason we got involved in that is be primarily because of the fisheries. You know, it looked like to us, you know, we're going to have some better access to uh, probably one of the better streams of fishing around here, and uh, and the habitat. You know, that's the, those are the two things that, that drive us. Um, we haven't taken a position on this, and we haven't uh, really reviewed this yet, but I'll, I'll bring that to the board, and I think you'll see some positive comments come in on this uh, from our board. Thank you. <coughs> I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm Gary Oldhouse, uh, president of Anaconda Sportsman's Club. And the club uh, stands in support of this project. Uh, we think it's a win-win when you look at both sides of the road. South side, we're going to have a good, uh, an, an added elk range, winter range especially. And by all means, this will eliminate um, uh, any kind of subdivision, and that's a big thing. Uh, on the north side of the road, or uh, around the creek, is uh, is the fish part of it, and the riparian, and that's very important. Uh, just like uh, this lady was referring to the kids being able to play and <clears throat> uh, they can't do that when it was locked up. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Dave Stone uh, with the Anaconda Sportsman's Club Vice President. I've lived here my whole life and uh, I've, I've had a chance to observe this property along with the whole wildlife management area. And it's unfortunate to have right out my window, actually, of the majority of it. And uh, I just, I can't see where it, we're going to lose at all by gaining this property. It's a chunk in the middle of the wildlife management area. It's like a bite out of it right now. And it needs to be filled in. We don't want development on that. And that's coming really fast in our future. I mean, that seems to be the thing now. People come in with... Lots of money, and they buy everything up and start subdividing. And pretty soon you've got houses where you add elk. Um, and I, I want to say something on the fencing. The Sportsman's Club has always been um, donating their time to help take out fencing. And we just finished up some on the WMA this summer. And we'd be available to take care of that fencing, too, and not you know, work on it with the volunteer. And Julie knows that. And concerning the fence that runs down the alley, uh, I would like to see all that wire removed off those posts and just put a like one rail through there to stop ATVs or whatever driving through there. And then kids can cross that with no danger or whatever and wildlife too. The posts are there. We could just put a rail on there, a wooden rail. Um, up at the, the west end of it, uh, years ago, they, there used to be a road across the creek there, 
and that came out on Stumptown Road, and I wouldn't want to see that started again. I would like to see that walk, put some rocks along there or something, uh, so people don't drive through that Warm Spring Strip there. Um, because I could see that happening, especially with the UTVs that are out there. They just, whoosh, we're over here on Stumptown Road already. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure these people behind me uh, remember that too, where they used to drive through there. So um, that would need to be made, make sure that was blocked off. And as I was, I was writing my EA last night, I, um, my comment to the EA, I, was, I looked out, the, out there and there was a, a white-tailed buck with four does out there on that platform. <coughs> and it was, it was just beautiful to see it out there. It was just perfect sunlight and everything. And it was just, yes, we need to have that in public ownership. Yeah. That's my comments on it. Thank you. Thank you. Just one real quick follow-up on my concern about predation. Sure. Wolves have been introduced in Montana. We got wolves in here now. It's a problem. Yes, when season opens to harvest wolves, when you close this hole, <coughs> uh, you get in there and access to cook, to harvest wolves off of depredation on your wildlife, as you want to say, if you can't get access. The whole area is closed from December first to May fifteenth. What do you mean the season opens? I, I don't understand. It's December first. Yeah. Buying season oh. opens. And December is a lot of the times when trapping becomes productive, and it's, it's wolf control. We don't have any. I did want to respond to one comment you made earlier uh, when you said that you'd spoken to Ray. So just for the benefit of everyone here, Ray is the owner of this range for it, is the owner. I have, if, if he did not know about it, that's incumbent upon me, and that's my fault. I have been emailing him with updates and I let him know the results of the commission meeting and I let him know all this stuff. Um, he lives in South Dakota so whatever other opportunities there were to learn about it through the normal channels for publication he may not have and if, if that's the case. And the reason I brought that up is because I got I had to go through and make sure that I renewed my permission from Ray to access that property for lime depredation. So if, if that's true if he did not know about it it's my fault. But you explain you explained to him the process. Certainly, yes, yeah. Okay. So he knew this was coming. Certainly, but he may not have known the exact date. Yes, it was in the paper though, in the um, legal section of the paper and on literature. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Aaron Ravendall. I uh, thinking about because I live there in the Gulf. We're talking about the west side of the property now, and. Uh, there's presently an access somewhat uh, there in the Gulch. It, just by coincidence, we're going to go back to 2001, as you mentioned, and how all this started. If I go over to Barker Creek and I come up on the back side, the gates there have a sign on them that say, no motorized vehicles. Okay? But in the Gulch where I live, there's no such sign. Uh, there's old signs from two, 2018 that talk about uh, not valid this area for elk tag B. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> they did not put those up again this year. Uh, so it's kind of just a neglected area. When I was there this afternoon, I took some photographs. There wasn't any vehicles there, but it's just like a big mud hole. And then I took pictures of where the actual gate is, which has a lock on it. And my only point is, that some of this has just kind of fallen by the wayside with the way this plan went with the original WMA. And so I'm a little gun shy of what's going to happen if some of these uh, promises in the sky that you guys are making are actually going to go through. Uh, I went and took the pictures that Ray had posted up some no trespassing signs on the gates right there at this uh, access point. It is a problem for the hunters that come in there on horseback with horse trailers, they jam them in there. It was just two days ago. I was looking out my window, and there was a tra horse trailer going down the road. And when I, this was in the morning, early. And when I went to go to town, I saw why he was going down the road. There wasn't any room for him to park there. There was already two outfits in there. 
but I just want to point that out that um, that particular, I'll call it a trail, it's, it's uh, the people from DNRC, they actually can access through there and go up and thin uh, some of the clear cuts. Uh, but that trail uh, is kind of the access to go up behind Garrity from, from that side of town. So let me, just for clarity, you're talking about where Ravendale Road, you can turn left and then there, that's all, it's on private land and it's DNRC. There doesn't, there's no fish wildlife parks land there now. Right? Correct. 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 However, those yeah, we'll signs that I mentioned about the, uh, the, the B tag being invalid and all of that, mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe that's my answer. Maybe that's why there's no sign saying no vehicles. Well, that's a, that is public. That is public access. DNRC purchased a legal easement to that green gate across. Because I know right there. Ray's pro Dorax property. I know right there's a, a state state land uh, school right. section. Yeah. It's on my my section where I live mm -hmm. that borders that. Well, people that go back there, there's. My only point is, people that go back there, they're not going to see a sign that says no motor vehicles. So when they're on that easement, they're parking on foot traffic easement. That's right. So I don't the, believe there's any authorization or for the or trailer to actually be there. Yeah, I don't know. That's a DNRC easement. I really don't. But it will be a DNRC easement then across Fish Wildlife and Parks property. So um, <clears throat> I guess that's something that we'll certainly have to deal with. Because Ravendale Road's a county road, is that correct? Uh, if you say so. I think so. <laughs> well, I'll provide some public commentary. My name is Joe Romero, and uh, on the overall, I, I like this proposal. I think it's a good idea in promotion of wildlife habitat, particularly winter and elk habitat, and public access. Uh, finding the balance there, I think, is a really important part where we provide access, particularly for fishing habitat on the north side of the road and for those who would like to use, um, to access that uh, wildlife management area. On the south side of the road would be, would be extremely beneficial, I think, just about how we do it. And if, I think it would be prudent upon this stage in the game to set aside at least a commentary where we say, you know what, if we're going to do this, then we will place, put in place a plan to uh, develop parking for horses where the corrals are, which makes sense to me, because if anyone's going to use horses, they want to use the corral, and we're not going to take down the corral per this plan. Um, and on the north side of the road, have, you know, the potential for a campground, per se, just to have it in the language documented, because otherwise, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm just distrusting of government, I don't know. But the thought is that I want to know that the possibility is out there, it's been well documented, that if we decide 10, 15, 20 years from now that a campground is a prudent idea, that we can go ahead and do that on the north side of the road or put facilities in there or whatever it is, I don't know. Whatever the public interest is, whatever's best for the habitat, whatever's best for the overall picture. I just don't want it to be like, well, okay, um, we've talked about this, but it's not really well documented and then five years from now, from now, 20 years from now, we're not, we haven't done anything with it. Because, oh, well, we didn't say it up front. So I want to put it on the record that we, we are talking about that. I think our community values that and I think it'd be great for, for wildlife and habitat and all that. So that's all I've got. Thank you. I've got a question. Sure. <clears throat> um, with that thought, is there, uh, what is the, the method or what is the, the process of, of going through an uh, established uh, uh, wildlife management in the general area and, uh, and reprogram it? Oh, like visit the management plan and yeah. reword a management plan? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I'm sure well, that's... Say like put in access where there never was one and... It's not, or or change. Well, that's access, or change uh, uh, the time of year when it's closed. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but 
certainly in consideration of having a new addition to a property, I'll certainly inquire upward. So I think to, I think the, the way I understand it to uh, sort of amend the overall wildlife management area plan would be another EA process. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be separate from some of these other conversations that are more of like a development question. Mm -hmm. It's just so, a point of interest. Yeah. So what I, so what I, what I could kind of envision for the future would be another EA process that's a development process. Once we've learned a bit, a little bit about how the property is being used, what the interests are from the community, which we're getting some right now, we would have another EA process for these sorts of developments. Say, okay, we don't have enough parking for horse trailers, but there's a lot of interest in use for horse trailers. Where can we possibly make that work better? Uh, this fencing has ended up not being needed, or maybe this fencing, we need more fencing in this area. Those sites of things can all be incorporated into another one of these processes later. So this certainly doesn't exclude any of that kind of stuff from happening. This is simply about purchasing the property with a few minor developments to make sure that, you know, fences aren't getting run down and people aren't parking right along the way. Point of inquiry, too. Is the EA process, if we're going to go to the secondary step, is that an expensive process? Is, how is that funded by FWP or, or otherwise. I mean, I could imagine where once we acquire the property, it's out there, it's public, and then we hit kind of a roadblock because no one wants to spend the dollars on even doing the evaluation. Um, and that's where I worry where my distrust of government <laughs> comes in. <laughs> not that you're not motivated, I know you are, and I know you want to use this to the best of your ability, but if the resources aren't there financially from, from either the state or um, through these um, damage dollars, um, I just want to make sure that we have a contingency in place to say we can reevaluate and look at another EA. Is that a, is that a pricey thing or is that, what is that? The like? EA process, yeah. just in general. So it's basically staff time and, you know, gas to drive for the public meeting, renting the hall and those kind of things. So uh, the, the price is pretty well wrapped up in staff time. Is that, would that be accurate? It is, it is a process we engage in all the time and I've never heard of cost. Um, being an impediment at all. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah they'd never say, no, you can't, can't do that EA process because we don't have enough money to commit staff time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And even, I mean, with these kind of things, once we get through that process even, then you get to d construction and design within the department. And I think we've all experienced some slow frustration as far as how those processes could be, you know, with the Garrity side and the viewing area and stuff. But, um, uh, it's not stagnant, but it's just, you know, it's benched out month by month by commission meeting, by approval, by grants, and things like that. So it can take a few years to sometimes get that parking area to be a reality. Um, fortunately, staff turnover, I think, was a bad thing uh, with the time and some of that stuff before, but um, I don't think there's, this is all fairly routine as far as all the ideas we've talked here, I think, have been done on other WMAs to an extent. So it's not like we're reinventing the wheel, it's just, typical state government process and transparency kind of stuff. Awesome. What I've heard tonight, or what I would take away from this tonight is, um, we so just did this acquisition on Lime Kiln Road, 156 acres, acres or whatever it was. Um, you know, there, there was not a big talk about what's going to happen next there, because there was some discussion, maybe a trail, maybe a little footbridge or something, but nothing, there, it's not like it's suddenly going to be a destination spot for hundreds of people. And, I think what I would take away from this tonight is that there is equal interest from the public in how this is, how their access is utilized and managed as there is in the general acquisition. Yeah. And that I would personally recommend that the department like engage in a, wait a year or whatever it is to like get our feet under us and then engage in a pretty robust process. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I'm not sure. I think that that is what I would take away from the comments I've heard tonight. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I want to add one thing here that, and I've, I've said this before, but, you know, we're really great at coming in here and saying, yeah, I go buy that piece of ground, and, you know, and um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not oblivious to the fact that when I look at what the department owns now compared to what we owned 20 years ago, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, you know, we've got, we've, we've had made some significant, uh, accomplishments and acquirements and I want to make sure that because this was a criticism when we got Habitat Montana 
in those hearings 35 years ago, 40 years ago. You guys won't take care of this, you know. And so there was this huge percentage of the Habitat Montana, like 20% of the money that's collected goes to maintenance of these properties. You know, so there's a budget. So my point is this. As we accumulate more, as we see we need additional temporary people or full-time, you know, we need another position here. I look at, you know, we went out and squatted dog last year and we were critical of a lot of things. <coughs> um, but if we're going to do grazing and all of that stuff, and if we're going to require guys to go out there, then um, we should be, we shouldn't be afraid to go ask in the legislature and say, we did this because, and we would testify for, if we said, we're going to spend our license dollars on this sort of thing, and we support that. We got these WMAs, and if it means that, you know, we've got to have more people out there to spray weeds or to work on the roads or to, you know, all the things that these are not three properties, um, we're supportive here too. Um, take our hunting license dollars and let's hire people. Um, you know, I want you doing biology work. I don't want you doing maintenance work on the WMA. I think that that's, you know, we should, you know, so when we have maintenance, let's make sure, we, and if we don't have enough maintenance people, Let's hire maintenance people, and let's, you know, so um, we shouldn't be oblivious to that, and this is another, another, because to me, this property is so close to town, there's all these things we talk about, they're going to probably involve some people on the ground just to go out and do things, you know. Yeah, all this stuff we're talking about, we have campgrounds and things yeah, like well, that. Yeah, well, just even not without a campground, just if you have an access site, and, and you know, you're probably going to need to put an outhouse in there temporarily, because somebody's got to we will take it down, you know, if we're going to maintain these fencing, and if we're, you know, if we build a parking lot in there, then there's going to be things that, you know, and we're going to, if we build a parking lot in there, which I think we should, then uh, probably every couple of years, we're going to spray weeds, you know, da -da 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 -da. so, and I would, so while I'm talking about it, because it's thought blew through my mind a little bit ago, <laughs> is that I'm on the, I don't forget what they call it, but it's the weed advisory board, whatever, we get two million dollars to spend which is phenomenal, you know. And um, we meet once a year, we're going to meet, the proposals that actually have to be submitted, I think, in the next few weeks, and then we're going to meet, I think, the first or second week in January. But it's a significant amount of money. But the reason I mention it is that last year, one of the, we had, I think, only three proposals that we funded. Um, we didn't have that many applicants, but they were all very large. One of them was on the WMA, and we bought down, what's the creek? People go Missoula, where we bought the Fish Plum Creek land, and we bought Fish, Fish, Creek. Fish Creek and Fish Creek. Oh, yeah. So there was a fairly significant project over yeah. five or seven years or eight years that was, I don't know how much it was, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, might even be pushing close to a million dollars to, you know, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. The reason I mention it is we've got Garrity Mountain now. We've had, now this will be the fourth acquisition that we've added to that original purchase. It had a lot of weed issues. I don't know that it's, I don't think it's out of control, I think that, but we still have some weed issues, we tried some things, but what I'm saying, I guess, here is that there's monies out there if you put a large-scale, comprehensive program together to, to do that, because um, I don't, I, I, I'm not oblivious either to the, some of the comments we get is, yeah, you guys buy these WMAs and then you don't take care of them, you got a weed problem, and I don't think that that's, I go up here west of town, the piece that we bought, Right north of the game range, the you what know, we call it, piece of it now. But that was a that, that property was junk, and it, and it literally was covered with junk, and it was literally covered with napweed. And if you go up there, that property has never looked. The department's owned it for I don't know six or eight years, and that property's never looked that in good in my whole lifetime as it does now. The, so the blue-eyed Nelly, the blue-eyed Nelly, and, and, and stuff up there, you know that. And so we do. I think we do good work, um, and I just remind you that there is those monies out there if you have a larger scale comprehensive multi-year project and this property at some point you might say I need to do something bigger than what we've been doing and and, uh, and I do sit on that advisory um, not that I'm just going to vote for anything but it but I but I see the projects that come in and there are some really good concept projects that, that come in on that I want to add to that cleanup up there in July now too. This um, Anaconda Sportsman Club was a significant partner in that. Um, Tin Can Gulch was plumb full of car bodies. Uh, people would take their old cars and junkers up there and just pull the tires off them and leave them. You know, and 
It was quite a project to get that all cleaned up in there. Is that where it got its name? That, there was, yeah, yeah there was hundreds, hundreds so, so, of so I'll tell you the story just because we're about that so people can appreciate the story but when we went up there when we went up there um, there the people literally back in the 20s and the 30s would just when your Model A and Model T were out you would just park it and then it became like the community junkyard and people would go up and well, I need this part, and so they, you know, I need a front axle for a 32 or a 24 or whatever, and they would, and so there was all these car bodies, and then it became the local keg party venue, and et cetera, et cetera, and so back in the, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago or something, there was a big cleanup, and they cleaned a lot of those car bodies out, but there was a few left up there, and there is, and so we had this big cleanup that they was talking about. We went up there and uh, God, it was great. The community, we must have had 30, 40 people up there. and A lot of it was just junk that had been up there. We, I think we filled two or three dump trucks. And So at the end of the day, we're walking up Tin Can Gulch, right? So we're walking up, and we're way up in Tin Can Gulch, probably half a mile up there or something. I mean, a little ways up there. And we're walking up, and Freddie Boyer and I, and I'm trying to think of who the third guy is, and we're walking up to, and there's a car line still sitting up on the hillside. And it's probably 30 or 40 yards out of the bottom, that steep bottom. And it's up there, kind of leaning, you know, it's, and it's been there for a long time. And the guy goes, and the guy's thinking to himself, he says, how the hell, did that, there's no road above it, how the hell did that car get up there? Mm -hmm. And Freddie said, I think I might have been part of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew exactly what he said, what happened. The, the Those guys stole a bunch of dynamite, one of them from the wine quarry when they were blasting up there. They stole a case of dynamite, and then they went out and when they partied, they would go blow stuff up. And they weren't vicious, so they didn't, they blew up old outhouses that weren't being used. Certainly weren't occupied by the <laughs> And uh, Freddie says, I think I was here because one of the things they do is they go up there and have a party, and then they pick an old car body and they would see how far up the hill they could blow it out of the bottom. And Fred remembered blowing that car up. You know, from, this is in the 1960s. So it was 50 some years ago they blew that car body up. And it's still sitting up there. We didn't it's clean still it. there. Yeah. It's still there. We didn't clean it up. So that's the story. So when you tin can go, there's some history around this place that is pretty interesting. But it's very pristine now. You know, it's a great sheep habitat and everything in there now. And They're always in there. It looks good, and the weeds always being taken care of and stuff. So yeah, it looks good. All right. Anybody else want to? One simple little comment, just as an ordinary citizen, and sure. that's all they claim to be. But I think it would be real sweet to have a nice little area where the some access to the creek for the grandkids to go fishing and all that stuff, real close to town, and maybe we could see an elk. I don't hunt them anymore. But I love seeing them come down, and uh, the, the deer are always there, and I'd rather see that than a cluster of trophy houses, and I say if we get a chance, let's do it, but we may never get the chance again. Mm -hmm. Can I get your name? Richard Clark. Richard Clark. Okay. Thank you, Richard. That's my wife, Willa. <laughs> All right, well, I think we'll uh, wrap it up if no one else has anything else to say. Um, also, maybe stick around for a little bit. Yeah. I know it doesn't pertain, but in the future, we have this thing in the newspaper about the, uh, the Miller Lake um, proposal with another assessment. And so another site, I mean, we're just barely talking about this one. I got another one proposed. And I wonder what's going on with... Uh, I'm mean, saying distrustful of the government. I'm distrustful of the government as far as what are they doing about snapping all this ground up? And it kind of pushes the private landowner out of the way. And I hear horror stories from people that move up here from California. And they used to have this nice lake that they used to go around. And then it got, uh, it got taken over by the government and they fence it off and then they charge people to go in there. So can you just answer me, uh, what, where are you going with all this as far as buying up all this land because the private landowner kind of gets pushed out? Yeah, I, I can answer that, you bet. So the, it does seem like there's a focus. There's this 
part of this, there's this lime kiln acquisition, there's a stump town acquisition. Miller Lake is a different uh, piece of the government, but it's right. it's government as well. And I but will you tell got you the Stucky Ridge Wildlife Management, you've got the blue. Blue Eye Valley. Valley. And I, I will tell you this, every one of those is, number one, a private, willing, uh, a willing private landowner. So every, none of those are the result of condemnation or anything like that. That's a private landowner that came to the department and said, I have a conservation ethic. I would like you or I would like somebody to take this land and to buy this land from me at fair market value. <clears throat> the department, and, and so that's how those have arisen. And the reason... Um, the reason they've happened here in part is because there's a pretty strong conservation ethic both with the Anaconda Sportsmen and with the community and they have members of the community have come forward and said would you be willing to entertain the purchase so um, FWP does not go out looking for land per se I think certainly in none of these cases um, every one of them was the uh, as far as I understand it the, the landowner coming to FWP and there's properties that are beyond our reach too that they approach us and we just we have to pay appraisal value so it doesn't I think go you much might better. understand from my point of view where mm -hmm. it looks like the private landowner is getting squeezed out mm -hmm. sure and the other thing is well the private landowner is willingly selling out I would agree with that mm -hmm. um, because there are none of these in which uh, FWP does anything except a arm's length transaction I will say Miller Lake is one where I believe that the people of Anaconda, some some people in Anaconda, came to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and the Forest Service and said, "Hey, this property is for sale." So that was not a case where the landowner approached. Okay, us. I, I didn't really need to bring that up in the future. Sure. But, uh, no problem. I but want, but I, I want to be clear. But. I use that as a springboard sure. for my question. Mm -hmm. sure. I, let me answer. Tell you one thing too. Miller Lake and this piece of property, the watershed property, Stucky Ridge were all properties that were Forest Service owned. And the Anaconda Company, through the power of their corporation back at the turn of the century, took those from the Forest Service. They traded them for land. So what we're getting is lands that were originally in public ownership, and we're getting them back. Now, we're not going to get them all back. They, they had 175,000 acres that they acquired from the Forest Service in the early 1900s. and. Uh, we're going to be at around, I don't have, with this, if we do Miller Lake, we'll be around 100,000 acres. Again, I know so it's future, but can yeah. I ask a question about Miller Lake? Is the land yeah. downstream from Miller Lake? Call, I'm going to call it Upper Mill Creek? Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. And the, and the, the bottom part, the bluff is Ingersoll. Um, I, don't, I don't know that he'd ever want to sell it, and I don't know if there's any interest in the public buying it, but... Certainly, when you have something like Mount Hagen, um, it's kind of our pride and joy here. We would kind of like to have it be in public ownership, you know. And right now, when people climb Mount Hagen, they actually are trespassing on the top of the mountain. All right. I just want to say one last thing. As yeah. member of the public, I, I praise and thank you all for setting this up. This has been very informational for, for me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Really Thank you for being here. And, and, and as Tori uh, said earlier, this does, certainly is not your last opportunity to comment. This was a, a formal hearing. That, but if, if you want to comment to anybody, like you can come give comments in writing, you can come, you can call, you can, email, you can talk. Yeah, so page 21 on the EA, you can also get the EA online, the FWP website. Um, that tells you all the ways to, to comment. You can comment online as well. We also have uh, you can take a sheet with you, write it down, send it into us. Um, you can write something down right now and hand it to me. We'll write it. Uh, whatever works best for you. Thank you. Thank you.